Hello and welcome back guys to this amazing episode of Track Medicine presenting to you Pharmacology today, right? So we have had a previous session where we discussed some of the questions but today we are going to have a comprehensive session on Pharmacology discussing the ins and out of the MRCP part 1 examination preparing for the upcoming exam some of the results have just come up hot and fresh so congratulations to all those guys who have cleared it really well done, you well deserved and there goes in a lot of hard work and effort for that so kudos to you and to those of you who could not clear it, maybe by less or more marks or whatever it was, we will help you in your journey. So be with us, be connected with us and we are here to help you. We are really striving very hard to create as much content as possible to help you in any way as much as possible. So all the best to you too. So nothing to worry. Let's just brush up pharmacology very quickly with the MCQs which are most frequented in your MRCP part 1 exam. The idea over here is not to go in depth about pharmacology but the idea is to crack medicine that is to understand what are the questions that the mrcp exam throws at you and how to deal with them okay so what are the different ways that they can put up the same question and what are the ways you can handle that question so let's just jump straight into it now steve jobs had a beautiful line here the only way to do great work is to love what you do right so here's the first question of the evening and uh, i hope there are no issues in the stream today i really apologize for the initial issues that were encountered previously okay so here's the first question for you with what is the mechanism of action of cyclosporin come on guys Okay, so I hope all of you know this one. The correct answer to this is calcineurin inhibitor, that is A. Now, the most important thing about cyclosporin you have to remember for your exams is what it does basically, it binds to cyclophilin. Okay, now the cyclosporin cyclophilin complex, okay. Now this is the NF80 that is activated factor, okay, the nuclear factor from the activated T lymphocyte cell. So this is the one that is being basically inhibited from translocating from the cytoplasm into the nucleus, right? So this NF80 goes over here and this is exactly where cyclosporin acts. Apart from cyclosporin, which is the other drug that works in the same mechanism, that is a calcineurin inhibitor. Come on, that is tacrolimus, correct? Like I have always said, we need to link everything and study. That is the only way we can remember this lot of content in pharmacology. There's a lot to remember and we are here to help you to understand how to remember that and frequently revise as well with you. Okay. So I hope this question is clear to you. Um, just for pharmacology purposes, they won't go very much deeper into it. Right. So what you have to understand that uh, in pharmacology, you just have to remember some of the questions, you just have to remember mechanism of action, but there are certain drugs like lithium, lead, phenytoin. Okay. These are the drugs that come up very frequently in your exam. If you understand what I'm trying to tell you here, you need to be very thorough with this. Okay. So you need to completely know it in and out. Moving on very quickly to the next question. Before that, we have put on this amazing table which tells you the most important mechanism of action of some of the drugs. For example, azathioprine, this is a purine synthesis inhibitor. Okay. Now, the azathioprine basically is a pro drug. Okay. And the active metabolite is 6 mercaptopurin. Right. That's how it affects. And it's basically a purine synthesis inhibitor. Now, in the same way, uh, like I said, tacrolimus and cyclosporin share their mechanism of action. Another very important drug is rituximab. The only thing you have to remember for your part one exam for rituximab, it is just a CD20 inhibitor. Okay. If you remember this sentence, it is more than enough for you. Right. And definitely you should know methotrexate. It is a DHFR inhibitor that is dihydrofolate reductase inhibitor. This is one of the reason that it is contraindicated in pregnancy. If you understand the mechanism of action, you can obviously understand the side effects and the effects it is going to cause. Right. 
So you can understand that it is contraindicated in pregnancy very easily, right? So that's how you are going to link the things and you're going to remember it. Okay, so the second question for the evening is which of the following drugs exhibits zero order kinetics? Good thing with pharmacology is, especially in your exam, this is the one point where you can gain some time. If you know the answer, you're going to just throw it correctly. Do not waste much time on it. Do not give it a long thought. If you give a long thought, you definitely going to mess it up. So what you're going to do is, whichever answer comes first into your mind, you're just going to go away with that. Okay, just take that. So which of the following exhibits zero order kinetics? Come on guys, tell me. I'll give you 10 seconds for that. Okay, so the right answer to this one is without any doubt heparin, right? So the correct answer here is C heparin. Right. Now, zero order kinetics, you all know this that the metabolism of drug is independent of its concentration. Basically, zero order is like this. It goes like this. Like when the this is the level of drug, or rather the concentration, serum concentration of drug. And on this axis. And here is the metabolism of the drug, like how fast the drug is going to be metabolized by the body. Now, as you can see, as the drug concentration increases, the metabolism also increases in a linear fashion up to a certain point. This is where zero order kicks in. Okay. So there is a maxima that is achieved. Okay. Now, after which the metabolism flatlines, right? So basically what goes on increasing is the concentration of the drug. So a very slight increase in the concentration beyond this maxima of the body will cause a very high rise in the concentration of the drug, right? That is why it is very liable to cause toxicity. Okay. So the drugs exhibiting zero order are very liable to cause toxicity. And that is why they are asking you this question again and again. So what are some of the drugs that we definitely need to remember? Most important is phenytoin. Phenytoin is the one which gets metabolized by zero order kinetics. Okay. If you want, I can repeat it again. But you definitely have to remember phenytoin. Apart from that, salicylates and heparin also is the one which is dealt with in a zero order fashion. Now, since we're talking about heparin, I would like to tell you some of the points about heparin over here. There are two more things that you definitely need to know about heparin. Now, the first thing that is how does it act? What is the mechanism of action of heparin? Right? So the MOA of heparin, we are talking of heparin over here, right? So the MOA is very simple. Come on guys, tell me, type in the comment box and tell me what is the mechanism of action of heparin. So it basically activates antithrombin 3, right? That is the basic action of heparin as well as um, low molecular weight heparin that is LMWH, right? Which is the basic fundamental action. Also apart from that, it forms a complex that basically inhibits your factors that are 10, 9, 11, and 12. Mind you, these are all activated factors, right? So these are the factors and they are inhibited by heparin. Okay. So this is the one that is being activated and this is the one that is being inhibited. These are the factors. So this is the first thing about heparin. Okay. Okay. So the side effects obviously is bleeding. That is the first thing. And the second point that I wanted to talk to you, the second side effect is HIT, HIT, that is heparin induced thrombocytopenia. What happens in some of the cases is it's an immune mediated uh, process, which forms antibodies. Okay. Now these antibodies, they cause activation of platelets. Okay. And uh, what happens is that they start destroying the platelets. So there is a massive thrombocytopenia that is there, which is due to the administration of heparin. Now, the problem with this is it takes around five to 10 days. Okay. So you can have a patient who has had a major surgery and you have started the patient on heparin prophylactically later on. And then what happens is five to 10 days into the treatment process, you see that there is a 50% or greater reduction in platelets. 
but despite the reduction in platelet it uh, platelets it's a pro thrombotic condition right it promotes the formation of thrombi everywhere okay so now once you have encountered hit what it is that you're going to do you're going to treat it you have to switch the anticoagulation to something called as pondaparinux or danaparinoid or you can also use leperidin right so these are the things that you're going to use also guys another important question that often comes with heparin is what is the antidote of heparin now the beautiful thing about heparin is we, there exists an antidote right that is why we use heparin these are not available readily for other drugs right other anticoagulants you cannot directly reverse the other anticoagulant so the anti uh, like the overdose of heparin can be reversed by reversal is caused by or the antidote is protamine sulfate so these are your most frequently tested questions surrounding heparin okay so this is how you have to study guys and this is how you will remember it guys because you cannot remember it separately you have to understand all of the details associated with one drug at one place right now because of this if there's a the existence of protamine sulfate if there is a very massive bleeding associated with heparin you can immediately reverse it all right so coming to the third question guys i'll give you 10 seconds again what is the mechanism of action of simba starting these questions you do not even need to see the option okay so the correct answer is what e right so it inhibits hepatic cholesterol synthesis all right now here is another beautiful table that tells you what drug acts how so statins Nicotova statin, Rosva statins, they inhibit hepatic cholesterol synthesis via the enzyme inhibition of HMG CoA reductase. Now, most of you would know the answer as HMG CoA reductase, right? But sometimes they can, this is how they will twist the question. There is no HMG CoAs here in the option, right? There is nothing like this in the option. So, this is how they're going to twist the question, okay? We all know that this. Uh, statins they act by inhibition of the enzyme hmg coa but basically they are inhibiting hepatic cholesterol synthesis okay in a similar fashion uh, the other drug that is used newer one that is used is acetamide since it's a newer drug it can come up in your exams basically inhibits the absorption of cholesterol from your intestines fibrates we all know uh, we use for hypertriglyceridemia right so they are basically PPAR alpha agonist. Okay. This is how they act. Also, a beautiful drug is called cholestyramine, which is a bile acid sequestrant. Now, sometimes in certain conditions, when there is a heavy outflow of bile acid, there is a massive outflow of bile acid in the body, and the patient complains of massive pruritus, this is the drug that you're going to use. Okay. So, remember cholestyramine. In cases of massive pruritus associated with increase in the biliary secretion, this is the drug you're going to use. Okay. Moving on to the fourth question of the evening, and be very careful when you encounter questions that include pregnant women in it, because the drug choices might change. Right. So this one talks fairly simply about a drug which is absolutely contraindicated during breastfeeding. So, which is the drug, guys? The correct answer is lithium, right? Like I said, be very thorough with lithium. Now, here's a small list of the drugs that cannot be given during breastfeeding. Okay, so you can remember when by the mnemonic A logic, A for amiodarone, O for estrogens, right? L for lithium. 
right? Uh, G for gold, I for endometacin, and C for cytotoxics. So, uh, although the amount of the drug secreted in the breast milk is usually very small, but still, if the BNF says they are completely contraindicated, they are completely contraindicated. No questions whatsoever. Right. So amiodarone, lithium, estrogens, gold, endometacin, and cyclo, uh, cytotoxics as well as chloramphenicol causing blood dyscrasias. They are completely contraindicated in your breastfeeding during breastfeeding. Also amiodarone, what does it do? It causes thyroid abnormalities. There's a long list of uh, side effects associated with amiodarone. Let's see if we encounter that again or else I will give you that separately. Now aspirin causes neonatal bleeding and Reyes syndrome. Okay, Reyes syndrome is associated with aspirin so remember that moving on to the next question of the evening this is what exactly i was talking about a while ago what is the most appropriate medication in a community acquired pneumonia in a pregnant woman basically that is the question And the first drug that comes to mind when we talk of community acquired pneumonia from the options is clarithromycin. But guys, that is not the right answer. The correct answer is amoxicillin. Okay. This is the right answer here. Why? We will discuss it now. Because just like the previous table, there are other drugs that are contraindicated during pregnancy. Some are absolutely contraindicated. Some are other category X. You do not know whether they are definitely going to damage or they can cause damage, but you need to avoid those drugs in pregnancy. So the first one that comes here is clarithromycin. We were talking about it. What does it do? It causes cardiovascular developmental defect. So basically, all of the drugs that are contraindicated in pregnancy will cause some or the other sort of developmental defects. What? You have to remember. How? I will tell you how. Right? So clarithromycin, not only it causes cleft palate, IUGR as well as it causes cardiovascular developmental defects. Now we all know tetracycline, right? So tetracyclines, they cause side effects on the fetal developing teeth and bones, right? Chloroquinolones. Now this is the most debated topic of the exam right now because most of the guidelines, they are moving away from chloroquinolones. Why? Because it not only causes congenital malformation and limb defects, Chloroquinolones are also notorious to cause tendon rupture. Okay. Now this side effect of tendon rupture is being taken up very seriously and wherever you have a better option than fluoroquinolones, please, please go with that option. Uh, do not opt fluoroquinolones in a hurry. Okay. So superfloxacin, ofloxacin, they are very beautiful drugs, but do not opt them as an answer in your question very uh, easily because that might cause some of the things to, uh, you know, like uh, they cause basically tendon rupture and that is why the BNF has basically advised to move away from that. Okay, moving on to the next question of the evening. So the following conditions is least likely to be associated with steroids. So basically it is trying to ask all of the side effects of steroids, right? Very important topic guys. Steroids and long-term administration of steroids and what all it causes, very important. So what's the right answer, guys? So basically, all of these are side effects, but hypertension is not usually caused in majority of the patients, right? In fact, what is caused is hypertension, right? Here is the right answer, right? In fact, steroids are one of the drugs that are used in hypertension. Like the patients who present to us with hypertension, severe shock, but once you have ruled out the other things, you can administer steroids. So the other side effects can be remembered using this mnemonic, AM, that is AM, Cushingoid. Now, a is for acne, myopathy, Cushingoid facies, Cushingoid appearance, right? That is definitely that also causes cataract. Ulcers are very important, guys. Long term administration, you definitely have to think of ulcers. Stray and skin thinning can be seen. It is definitely seen. Now, one of the notorious side effects of steroid is AVN, right? Avascular necrosis of femoral head. So once you're giving long term steroids in older females, be very wary of this particular side effect, AVN, right? 
Also, it can cause glycosuria, obesity, definitely osteoporosis, insomnia, immunosuppression, depression. Now, osteoporosis and AVN, I would like to tell you that in cases of uh, treatment of osteoporosis, patients who are on long-term treatment with steroids, the Z score that you will use for initiation of uh, drugs is not minus 1.5, like usually 0 to minus 1.5 and that is lesser than or equal to minus 1.5. Beyond this, you will initiate treatment, right, with denosumab or teriparatide, right, or zolindronic acid. But in cases of patients who are already on long-term steroids, the threshold for osteoporosis diagnosis as well as initiation of treatment goes to minus 2.5, okay? Remember this, especially for your exams. So whatever we are talking today, we are talking in respect of exams. That is what we are all concerned about here. Right, so now you remember all the side effects of steroids. Let's move on to the next one. Anywhere if you feel that you know the class is going a little faster than you want or slower than you want, please use the play speed buttons as well as you can pause the video and think of the answer whenever you want, right? Don't be in a hurry to answer it. Right? You have approximately 90 to 100 seconds in the exam setting to answer your question. So you can use this much time. There's no harm in that. But I would strongly suggest in pharmacology, try to gain as much time as possible because this is the one that will require the least amount of struggling with the questions. Most of the questions will be very straightforward. Okay, guys. So which one of the following drugs is least likely to cause gynecomastia? Come on, guys. Okay. So we know that cimetidine, digoxin, methyl dopa, it causes. There's some controversy about metronidazole, but here the least likely answer is nicorenti. So this is the correct answer here. Rest all of them, they cause gynecomastia. So spironolactone, the star drug of all the ones that definitely causes gynecomastia. Since it is being used a lot in cases of heart failure, you have to understand the side effect. Digoxin, same. Cimetidine not used anymore, but questions, they do come. Alcohol, long-term administration and metronidazole, long-term administration, which is not frequently seen. But definitely, uh, long-term alcohol and spironolactone is the one that you definitely have to know. Okay? So these are some of the drugs associated with gynecomastia. Let's move on to the next question. Come on, give it a read, guys. I'll give you exactly 10 seconds. Okay, so the right answer is, it is contraindicated in patients with SBP, that is spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. So this is false, right? It is not contraindicated. Terlipresin is definitely indicated. It's a vasopressin analog, right? Now, first thing where terlipresin is the drug of choice for what, guys? Very seal hemorrhage or bleeding, right? So this is the drug of choice in active variceal bleeding, guys, okay? Remember this, terlipresin is the drug of choice for that. So it's an vasopressin analog that is used in variceal hemorrhage as well as hepatorenal syndrome. Most importantly, what is the mechanism of action? It causes flanknic vasoconstriction, right? Remember this, flanknic vasoconstriction is important. And definitely you can use it in patients associated with ascites as well as SBP because most of the patients who are in refractory shock, right? I know trope, resistant septic shock, they will have SBP, right? This is how SBP is causing this shock. So you can use terlipresin in that, okay? Very beautiful drug, acts very quickly. The results are very fairly quick, okay? Also, in cases of ascites, the combination of terlipresin with human albumin, right? Albumin is definitely given. So, you have to understand that these two, they go hand in hand. Also, in case of patorenal syndrome, make sure you not only give terlipresin, but apart from that, you also give plasma expander that is human albumin solution. Moving on to the next question of the evening.
Okay, guys. So, which of the following drugs is the most likely cause? So, the right answer is lithium. Now, what is the disease process that we are talking about? It's not a disease, but the side effect of lithium. That is diabetes insipidus, right? So, this is the one that we are talking about here, causing polydipsia and polyuria, definitely. Now, what sort of, there are two types of DI, nephrogenic and cranial uh, DI. So, which is the one that lithium causes? It causes nephrogenic DI. Please remember this. Right? That is why it is very resistant to treatment also. Other side effects are leukocytosis, tremors, okay, teratogenicity, contraindicated in pregnancy. Hypothyroidism, contraindicated in breastfeeding. Interstitial nephritis, nausea, vomiting, and acne, weight gain, T wave flattening. But most importantly, fine tremors, DI, these two are the ones that will be frequently tested in your exams. Also, there are some drugs that can precipitate lithium toxicity. Now, you will be given a scenario where a patient is a patient with. Okay, so in this scenario, it will be like there's a patient with long term bipolar disorder diagnosed as well as on treatment with lithium. So you will be asked, uh, like, the patient got uh, maybe the patient got hypertension, maybe the patient uh, got a community acquired pneumonia, maybe the patient went to some other doctor and was diagnosed with depression again, apart from bipolar disorder, like, you know, some other element was there, like a major depressive episode he encountered, he or she. So he, there was some other drug added on top of it. You have to understand that there are certain drugs that can precipitate lithium toxicity. So not only overdose of lithium is there, but also if you add in the second drug, that can precipitate the toxicity. You have to be careful of that and questions like these are frequently there. What we're basically trying to test here is that while you're prescribing the drugs, are you aware of the interactions that the drugs can cause to each other, right? So there are certain interactions that are definitely avoided and we'll be talking about them in the future questions, like the further questions that we're going to do. But let's move back to lithium, right? So the drugs that will precipitate lithium toxicity are CCBs, calcium channel blockers, right? Carbamazepine, haloperidol, AC inhibitors, as well as ARBs and SSRIs, like I was telling you, right? And triptans as well. But triptans, are, since they are used in very uh, lesser frequency, but SSRIs can be used in higher frequencies, so they can precipitate. Right, so this is about lithium. Uh, lithium is a very important drug, guys. So be very careful with lithium. Okay, and some other side effects of some of the drugs are given here in this beautiful table. Now, the first one is amisulpride, and but most importantly, carbamazepine is very important, guys, as well as lamotrigine is important because it is prescribed so much. Right, so carbamazepine causes SIADH, right, ataxia, and dizziness. These three are the most common side effects. Moving on to the next question, 10th question of the evening. 65 year old man presented with worsening blistering rash affecting his palms and soles of his feet. Two weeks ago, he had started chemotherapy for colorectal cancer. So the following is the most likely cause. Come on guys, I'll give you five seconds only for this one. Yes, the right answer is B capacitabine. Correct, very correct, guys. Now, there are certain side effects that are classic side effects. You must remember these, and that is why this beautiful table is given to you over here. Right? So, capacitabine causes hand foot syndrome, that is, T score meeting rashes both on the hands as well as foot. Bleomycin causes lung fibrosis. You have to, have to, have to remember this. Okay? And apart from bleomycin, the other one to cause lung fibrosis is busulfan. This also causes lung fibrosis. Okay. Cisplatin causes interstitial nephritis and ototoxicity as well, as well as peripheral neuropathy. All three are very important side effects. And cyclophosphamide, we all know bone marrow suppression is the most important side effect. Right? But the most frequently tested side effect of cyclophosphamide is what, guys? Hemorrhagic cystitis. Now, I need you to type in the comment box, what is the treatment for hemorrhagic cystitis? Come on, guys. You need to answer it quickly. Okay? And 
you should also know that methotrexate also causes pneumonitis that is methotrexate induced pneumonitis it occurs quite later in the administration in the process of the administration of drug but myelosuppression is something that you should be very wary of while administrating uh, methotrexate right that is why you have to always use methotrexate like if you are giving it weekly once or maybe twice in certain cases folinic acid is to be given apart from that like the day that you are administrating methotrexate you don't have to give this but on all the other days of the week you have to give this right folic acid as well can be prescribed and vincristine causes peripheral neuropathy guys tested i think it has been tested more than like 10 times in the exam moving on to the next question of the evening requiring some of the mathematical skills of our doctors which is amazing trust me guys i know your maths is good so you can calculate this come on the only thing which you need to be very wary of in these sorts of question is what is the drug frequency because what happens sometimes is we will see 45 milligram and we'll jump to the answer but what we'll be forgetting is that the drug is administered bd so it becomes 90 milligrams per day right so what do you do guys in that case is be very careful while reading the questions then so just before taking the right answer i think we should move and understand how to reach to this answer now in cases of oramov you have to understand that it should be one sixth of the daily morphine dose that is the standard dose for oramov so in this case since it is 45 milligram bd i am very sure you can calculate as as 90 milligrams divided by 6 is equal to 15 milligrams guys so that was fairly simple but only if we understand that it is one sixth of the daily dose of morphine right okay guys i think you are well aware of this let's move on to the next question and i'll give you 10 seconds for that All right, the right answer to this question is carbamazepine, all right. <clears throat> now, before we jump on to this question, there are certain other things that I want to tell you over here, right. So there are certain other conversions that I think you should know. So for example, if we are converting oral codeine to oral morphine. Right guys, what is the multiplication factor? You have to basically divide by 10. Okay, it is divisible by 10. Don't worry guys, I'll be posting the PDF of this session lecture on my website. You can go and download it freely from that. If you are converting from oral tramadol to oral morphine, notice the conversion guys you have to divide by 5 now you if you are converting reverse that is oral morphine to oral oxycodone in that case you have to divide by 2 Okay. Now oral morphine eighty to ninety milligrams in a twenty-four hour period is equivalent to a twenty-five microgram per hour patch of subcutaneous drug delivery system right okay so this is how you will convert it now if you convert from oral morphine to subcute diamorphine then you have to 
डिवाइड बाई थ्री इफ यू आर कन्वर्टिंग टू सबक्यूट डायमोफिन फ्रॉम ओरल ऑक्सी कोडोन इन दिस केस गाइज यू हैव टू डिवाइड बाई वन पॉइंट फाइव all right so we saw here that the oral morphine was to be divided by 2 in cases of oral oxycodone so oxycodone is double the potency of morphine so the same here guys if you are dividing it by 3 the oral morphine to subcute diamorphine so this must be double the potency so you have to divide by 1.5 all right okay Let's move on. Okay, so you answered the question number twelve correctly, guys. That is carbamazepine. Now let's understand what does carbamazepine is doing over here. So basically, it's causing SIADH. And how do you diagnose that? The urine is concentrated that is more than twenty millimoles per liter of sodium, as well as the urine osmolality goes up. Normally, it is three hundred to one thousand. This is the normal range, but a uh, value more than 500 indicates concentration of urine okay hyponatremia in the blood because obviously the sodium is going out over there and plasma osmolality is low if you look here guys there is a massive mismatch between the plasma osmolality which is quite low and the urine osmolality which is quite high okay so that is what is happening in siadh now the drugs that cause siadh okay another thing is that this is an euvolemic stage okay this is there is no evidence of hypovolemia or edema there is no water retention or no water loss here right but what is being lost is sodium okay so the drugs causing siadh can be remembered by diuretics that is thiazide of course rifampicin ssris opiates analgesics barbiturates and all the drugs that start from the let us see alphabet c carbamazepine chlorpromazine chlorpropamide and cyclophosphamide so we were talking about cyclophosphamide in the previous slide and i was telling you that what and all it causes some of the side effects i still want you to write it down in the comment section what is the treatment of hemorrhagic fibrosis guys right So this was about question number twelve. Let's move on to the next and very interesting question here. Question number thirteen. I give you ten seconds again to answer. Right. The correct answer here is guys. Lead poisoning. very correct it is d lead poisoning let's understand some features of lead poisoning it causes sim symptoms which are very similar to acute intermittent porphyria okay so in the question that gives you a combination of abdominal pain and neurological signs just like aip that is acute intermittent porphyria you also have to think of lead poisoning okay don't forget that so the features here are abdominal pain right very important feature then you have diarrhea as well in later stages anemia and cephalopathy and the most characteristic feature of lead poisoning is basophilic stippling guys if you see if you go back to the question if you see this line in the question please be 100% sure that the answer is lead poisoning okay there is no doubt about that right it is very characteristic right and also foot Oh, that is mononeuropathy here and encephalopathy so these two are your neurological signs also a lead line is seen in the gums and hearing loss can be there in cases of long term chronic poisoning first and the foremost step of management of any poisoning guys is to make sure that your patient has been completely you know like removed from the scenario or has that element of poisoning has been eliminated it's Could not be that there is still some contact with the skin of lead or some other poisoning. The first step of management of any poisoning, guys, always remember, is removing the patient from the source of poisoning itself. 
then you have to understand that there are two things that you can do here that is oral you can use the dimer captosaccinic acid as well as IV EDTA right okay so lead poisoning is definitely important now also in your investigations you will see that uh, if you perform blood and urine investigations there will be an increased uh, urine concentration of delta amino levulinic acid now this causes the real confusion between this and AIP okay so be aware that these two can present very similarly but definitely the question will give you some markers in the form of blue lines that is the gum lines and uh, basophilic stippling so this is how you will differentiate it from AIP Now here are some beautiful poisons and their poisoning effects. How do they act and what are the symptoms they produce? For example, if we talk of selenium here, how you should remember selenium is it is something that looks and tastes and odors like garlic. So patient with garlic breath odor is definitely a patient of selenium poisoning, especially for exams. Okay. In a similar fashion, if you see an arsenic patient poisoning of arsenic poisoning, you will definitely encounter mes lines that are horizontal lines on the nails like this, the nail plate. So these are horizontal lines on the nails that they are called mes lines. Okay, so remember this. As well as abdominal pain, diarrhea, and hepatitis can also be seen. Importantly, prolonged QTC is also important side effect of its poisoning. Cyanide poisoning, guys, is very important, and you have to be very careful and very quick about it. Now, if you look at the skin, there will be cherry red flushing of the patient with cyanide poisoning. Okay, so it will be like cherry red. Also, there can be cyanosis seen. Right. So these are the side effects of some of the poisons. Mm. I think this is about it. Moving on to the next question. I'll give you a little bit more, 15 seconds to answer this one. Also guys, when we were talking about cyanide poisoning, you should remember that the treatment of choice is 100% oxygen administration via, via what type of mask? That is the main question here. Via non-rebreathable mask, okay? You do not want the patient to be rebreathing the cyanide. And also remove the patient from the source. Okay, guys, so I think you have read the question, right? Now, come on, give me the right answer as well. Okay, so the treatment over here, most appropriate next step in management is hemodialysis. Okay, that is the treatment of choice here. Now, the thing you have to understand about salicylate poisoning is it has a very classical pattern of respiratory alkalosis followed by metabolic acidosis so initially there is hyperventilation and the patient has respiratory alkalosis and then later on the patient goes into metabolic acidosis due to the drug okay so this is respiratory alkalosis coupled with metabolic acidosis is a very classic of salicylate poisoning right now the plasma concentration more than 7.2 millimoles per liter in acute overdose is the indication for hemodialysis but clinical indications are altered mental status and clinical rapid deterioration of the patient. Okay. So these are the scenario where you will use hemodialysis. Right. Okay. So here's a quick question 15, question number 15. And uh, after this, we'll be taking a short break. So you can relax in that time and get ready for the next round of questioning as well as learning about pharmacology. It's a long question. You can take your time. And this is a classic question about what I was telling you about the drug to drug interaction, right guys? Okay. 
So the right answer to this question is clarithromycin. Right? Those of you who answered this question correctly, very good because this is a classic question of theophylline toxicity. Okay, if you go back to the question, the patient is already on oral aminophilin and then he was added with amoxicillin and clarithromycin. The examiner wants to know which of the following basically caused the theophylline toxicity. And you can see very beautifully both amoxicillin as well as clarithromycin are given in the option. But clarithromycin is the culprit drug which causes theophylline toxicity. Now, this particular question has a very important clinical correlation. That is, most of the patients who are asthmatic, they will already be on oral aminophilins, right? Some of the other type of aminophilins, they will be long-term administration of that drug. So, when you encounter a community acquired pneumonia on top of it do not be in a hurry to prescribe clarithromycin in such patients because it causes theophylline toxicity and it can be very dangerous like we'll know how right now right so features of theophylline toxicity include severe acidosis tachycardias and tachyarrhythmias most importantly tachyarrhythmias the patient can go into arrhythmias right and acidosis hypokalemia as well right and uh, now, CYP3A4, that is CYP3A4, is the enzyme that you have to remember in case of theophylin because the drugs that are CYP3A4 inhibitors like cimetidine, ciprofloxacin, clarithromycin, erythromycin, and verapamil. So, these are the drugs that cause theophylin toxicity. Be very aware of these drugs. They are basically CYP3A4 inhibitor, right? Okay. Now, the most important thing to treat over here is hypokalemia and tachyarrhythmias in this case of theophylline toxicity. So, use don't only use uh, just oral activated charcoal, but also use potassium supplementation if required. Okay, if not required, then it's okay. Charcoal hemoperfusion provides a higher rate of clearance than hemodialysis in this particular case. Okay. So remember theophylline toxicity, do not just jump to hemodialysis. Sometimes hemodialysis might not be the answer at all. So, hemoperfusion with charcoal is the one that causes a faster removal of theophylline from the body. Okay guys, so we will take a short quick break over here and we will be back with the next round of beautiful questions from pharmacology. I hope you all are enjoying it, right? So, we will be back in no time. Grab your cup of coffee or water and get refreshed again. So, we can be back and we will be back very shortly, okay?
Here's the another question for the evening. Question number 16. Which of the following statements regarding direct oral anticoagulants is correct? I give you 10 seconds for that. Only. So, the right answer is correct. That is D. They are at least as effective as warfarin in their action. All right. So, the drugs that are there in the direct oral anticoagulants, they are apixaban, dabigatran, and rivaroxaban. Now, the beautiful thing about them is, okay, so the beautiful thing about them is, that they have their mechanism of action written in their names. They are factor 10A, that is activated factor 10 inhibitors. This is inhibitor of factor 10A. So that is how you will remember it. Apixaban, right? Now, the thing, beautiful thing about them is you do not need to perform a continuous INR monitoring with factor 10A inhibitors, right? Which you have to do with heparin and other drug or warfarin, mostly warfarin. Right, especially long term warfarin patients, you have a target range like patients with metallic walls, they require warfarin uh, INR of upwards of 2.5 or a range between 1.5 to 2.5. This is the usual target range of INR. You, you do not have to perform a regular INR monitoring in cases of direct oral anticoagulant. Okay, the, the side effect or the problem with these drugs is there is no specific reversal agent. In cases of acute bleeding, so that is the problem with that, right? And dabigatran is a direct thrombin inhibitor, and BD dosing is the regimen that is used, and uh, with very less creatinine clearance, that is less than 30 ml per minute per kg body weight, that is you do not use dabigatran, okay? And uh, apixaban and rivaroxaban, like I told, they are anti factor 10 A inhibitors. Good thing with rivaroxaban is it's an OD dosage. So the number of frequency, if there's a higher frequency of drug administration, there are higher chances of non-adherence of drug. Okay. So another thing that I want to talk about is the recent movement from the word usage of non-compliant to non-adherent. Okay. So we are clinically more using the terminology like non-adherent instead of non-compliant because the there is this risk of uh, like you know the terminologies that you use as doctors are very important okay so make sure that you use the correct terminologies in specifically in regards with your patients okay so the next question of the evening is what is the mechanism of action of flecainide i'm sure all of you remember that table right antiarrhythmic table so the correct answer to this one is one guys yes correct e it blocks the sodium channel so here's the table that basically is your wagon williams classification of antiarrhythmics and their mode of action in the class 1c you can see flecainide and how you will remember that is there is a c in flecainide right so they are the ones that blocks your sodium channel. The class 1 agents are your sodium channel blockers. Class 2 are your beta blockers. Class 3 are your potassium blockers. And class 4 are your calcium channel blockers. Right? Also, flecainide is contraindicated in cases of known cases of structural heart disease. Okay? When you encounter a patient with structural heart disease, you should not use flecainide. So, this is how if you link the drugs and you link the mechanism of action and the side effects, this is how you will be able to remember them, okay? Also, very important here is amiodarone is a drug that also has a class one, two, and three activity. So it encompasses sodium channel, beta blockage effect a little bit, and most importantly, potassium channel. So if you are asked about one answer to be picked, it is always three, that is class three, that is potassium channel blocker, amiodarone, but otherwise, you should also know that it also has class 1 and 2 activity. Okay. Moving on to the next question, which is very important. Same drug dose calculation, but of a different drug that is hydrocortisone. So here, if you notice the total drug 
per day in intake of the patient is 30 milligram per day. Right? So the right answer to this is 7.5 milligrams. How we arrive to that answer? This is the table that we will encounter. Okay. All right. So this is the table that you definitely need to remember for your exam, how to change each of the corticosteroids to prednisolone. Okay. That is five milligram of prednisolone equals to approximately 20 milligrams of hydrocortisone. Okay. So if you half it, so 10 milligram of hydrocortisone will equal to 2.5 milligrams of prednisolone. So the total of 30 will equal to 7.5 milligrams. That is fairly simple. But you need to understand and remember that 5 milligrams of prednisolone equals to 20 milligrams of hydrocortisone. Okay. Moving on to the next question of the evening. This is a very important question, guys. Specifically, look at the age of the patient and look at the potassium values of the patient. Right? It is very severe hyperkalemia. So what has caused the severe hyperkalemia? The correct answer is right, D, ibuprofen. Now, NSIDs are very notorious to cause hyperkalemia. Basically, they are causing AKI, that is acute kidney injury in two different mechanisms. Okay, the first one is basically renal ischemia, that is due to the inhibition of the PG synthesis. But this is a reversible renal ischemia. And the second one is AIN, that is acute interstitial nephritis. Okay, and this later on can go on to cause nephrotic syndrome, that in long-term NSID usage. Okay. Other drugs that cause hyperkalemia, which are very important, are calcineurin inhibitors, that are cyclosporin tacrolimus, the first question of the evening, AC inhibitors, digoxin, potassium sparing diuretic, no brainer this one, right? Also, beta blockers can cause ARBs, NSIDs, and potassium supplements. So, definitely, you need to remember AC inhibitors, digoxin. And beta blockers also can cause that. So these are your drugs causing hyperkalemia. Remember them with the name CAD KBAN. Okay. Question number 20. Which of the following drugs can precipitate a masthenic crisis in susceptible patients? Very fairly simple, yet very important question. Okay, so the right answer is E. You are very correct. It is propanolol. Okay. So in myasthenic crisis, it's basically a life-threatening condition. And you have to diagnose it very correctly. It can intubation can be necessitated in such uh, scenarios. Okay. And, uh, there can be worsening dyspnea, tachypnea, and use of accessory respiratory muscles, paradoxical abdominal breathing, and the vital capacity of the patient goes very low. Okay. That's what is happening in a myasthenic crisis. Now, the, obviously, you should treat the patient with myasthenic crisis in an ICU or uh, in an HDU setting at least, but ICU setting is preferred. And how do you monitor a patient of myasthenia in a crisis? You have to monitor their vital capacity. Okay. So vital capacity is the only way that's how you're going to monitor the progression of the disease as well as the response to the treatment okay both ways you have to monitor the vc that is vital capacity as soon as you encounter that the vc is going lesser than 20 you have to intubate the patient now ivig is the first line treatment because it is fairly available now when you are given both the options in a question like plasma pheresis is also there as well as ivig is also there which would you choose now there is no right answer because both of them are used but since IVIG is easier to administer as well as it is fairly easily available, whereas plasma pheresis requires a larger setup and it is not available in all the setups, in such scenario, go with the answer of IVIG. Okay. Also, high dose steroids are given, that is prednisolone in the range of 60 to 80 milligrams. Only when you have administered all of these agents. Then you can move on to the next line of drugs that is azathioprine and mycophenolate mefetil if steroids are uh, not responsive to the patient. The patient is not responsive, only then you can move on to the next group of drugs. Okay. 
other drugs that can cause weakness in a patient with myasthenia mostly chloroquine beta blockers okay procainamide verapamil aminoglycosides very notorious right chloroquine alone again macrolides and tetracycline now you should remember all the side effects of all of these drugs very important all the antibiotics you should be very thorough with all of the side effects right okay so which of the following overdoses will cause a basically they are trying to ask which will cause a long qt interval apart from loss of vision hearing loss tinnitus and abdominal pain these are the classic symptoms of synchronism very correct it is quinine poisoning let's see what is happening in synchronism you not only have gi side effects which are the first one you also have ototoxicity that is deafness and tinnitus apart from blindness in certain cases can be encountered but it is uh, recorded but in your questions you will usually have tinnitus and deafness okay now arrhythmias and hypoglycemia so please be aware that hypoglycemia is a very strong side effect of quinine so this is the first one that you can see sometimes uh, in a patient so try to uh, correct it and pay attention to hypoglycemia as well okay blindness is a defining feature but it is not seen very frequently okay like the characteristic feature in lead poisoning i told you base of lick stippling but it is not necessary that you will see it in all of the cases okay but if you see it it is a def definitive defining feature right now once you withdraw the drug that is the uh, symptoms they fairly resolve okay and repeated doses of activated charcoal is the treatment of choice here moving on to the next one which of the following drug combinations is most likely to contribute to the increased risk of bleeding in this particular 50 year old woman i'll give you 10 seconds for that and i'll help you by underlining the important points in this question so basically they are trying to ask the interaction again like i was telling you before and the right answer to this question is d clarithromycin omeprazole and indomethacin okay so that is the right answer here why because they are all cytochrome p450 inhibitors as well as inducers so the mnemonic for inducers is pc bras and you will remember them via this table okay but clarithromycin and omeprazole are both p450 inhibitors and that is why they will cause an increased risk of bleeding in a patient which is already on warfarin okay so very 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 important question as well as association clarithromycin omeprazole and warfarin okay on the other hand carbamazepine it's an enzyme inducer okay so what it will do is it will increase the clearance of warfarin obviously and the problem is that it will reduce the efficacy of warfarin okay so here is the list for p450 inhibitors and you will be surprised to see that omeprazole is also there and allopurinol is also here please make a note of this isoniazid is also an inhibitor okay a funny thing is acute ethanol poisoning is an inhibitor while if we go to the previous slide chronic alcohol is an p450 inducer okay so remember that initially it inhibits the enzyme and later on it induces the enzyme okay p450 okay moving on to the next question of the evening now most of the questions here you will see that uh, you can also think that the why are we repeating questions from eternal medicine so much because they are they are in the exam so frequently also that it is very imperative to know the exact drugs that need to be administered in a pregnant patient okay because it is very important to know that the correct drug 
Now here they are trying to ask which is contraindicated. So fairly simple answer. I think most of you know it, right? It is Ramipril. AC inhibitors are contraindicated in pregnant women at any stage of pregnancy. Okay. Now they not only are related to cardiovascular system malformation, but also to the urinary tract malformation. The growth of the kidneys are inhibited in the uh, embryo stage because of AC inhibitors. The same action is with ARBs because both of them go hand in hand. Okay. And the drug of choice in pregnancy with hypertension is labetalol. This is the first one. This is the second one. This is the third one. This is the fourth one. Okay. All of these are drugs to be used in pregnancy. But these are only the four drugs that can be used in pregnancy. So be it pregnancy induced hypertension, preeclampsia or eclampsia. Moving on to the next question of the evening. So this question here deals with tricyclic poisoning or you can say uh, like the side effects. Okay. This patient already has a history of depression and she was treated with amitriptyline. So now if you see that the QRS duration is prolonged over here more than 100 milliseconds. This is prolonged QRS interval. This is prolonged QRS interval is a definitive, definitive treatment answer is sodium bicarbonate. This is the right answer. This is the thing that you will do when you encounter any such patient. Okay. So sodium bicarbonate is the one that you will use here, but uh, be very uh, sure that you will only use it when there are symptoms of cardiac toxicity. Do not just jump to sodium bicarbonate. Sometimes if the drug levels are very low, okay, the poisoning is not much severe. In that case, you can fairly administer normal saline that is sufficient. But if the poisoning is severe, that is you are noticing symptoms of cardiac poisoning. In that case, you have to go with sodium bicarbonate. Okay. Right. And also avoid drugs like procainamide that is class 1A and also 1C that is flecainide in the cases of TC overdose. So these are the two things that you need to remember in case of TC overdose. Okay. Amitron has no role whatsoever in this. Moving on to the next question of the evening. Okay, so what is the most likely cause guys over here? Right, the correct answer is B isoniazid. Correct. Now, peripheral neuropathy is the most important side effect and the most well recognized side effect of isoniazid. Okay, that is why we need to give supplementation of pyridoxin that is vitamin B6 along with administration of isoniazid in cases of pulmonary tuberculosis or other TB as well. Can also cause optic neuritis, but mostly um, peripheral neuropathy is the most important complication over here. Okay. Now, here's the table which is very important for an exam and you will be surprised to know that hepatotoxicity lies very low in the side effect adverse list of rifampicin. Okay. In fact, hepatotoxicity occurs earlier in cases of isoniazid, right? So most important one is orange discoloration of the secretions of body like tears as well. In isoniazid, you have peripheral neuropathy, okay, and agranulocytosis as well. Okay. Pyrazinamide hepatotoxicity is the known side effect. Also, please remember joint aches or pain. Okay. This is also a recognized side effect of pyrazinamide. Okay. This has been asked as a question. So do not forget that. My own glycosides, ototoxicity and nephrotoxicity is very fairly important side effect. You must remember that streptomycin causes ototoxicity as well as nephrotoxicity. Okay. This is a second line drug by the way. 
Moving on to the next question of the evening, 28 year old man, malaria prophylaxis, background of G6PD deficiency, which of the following should be avoided as antimalarial prophylaxis? Come on guys, very, very, very important question. Primaquin, absolutely right. So, in cases of G6PD deficiency, you have to avoid all of these drugs, okay? Like nitroferentoin, primaquin, dapsone, chloroquine, and quinine may cause, but primaquin is the most important one that you should definitely avoid. Okay. Aspirin at high doses can also cause G6PD uh, crisis, and that is hemolysis over here. But mostly remember that primaquin can cause that. And in antibiotics, nitrofurantoin is the first one to cause hemolytic crisis in G6PD deficiency. Okay. The same question can be twisted sometimes. Right? And this sentence that the background of G6PD will be removed. In fact, you will be given that the patient was put on anti-malarial prophylaxis with primaquin. And then there were the following are the blood values. The blood picture will be given. So the blood picture will have hemolytic picture, right? So what is the diagnosis? So the patient will have a diagnosis of background of g 6 pd deficiency. This is how they will twist the questions. But the idea remains fairly simple and the same. So question number 27 for the evening, guys. Okay, so the only two lines that you need to note over here is diarrhea and vomiting that is presumed viral gastroenteritis. This is the first sentence. Okay, and the second sentence is metformin. Why? Come on guys, type it into the comment box. Why do you want to avoid metformin in a patient with vomiting and diarrhea? Because of a very high risk of lactic acidosis. It's the most well-established side effect is lactic acidosis. Okay, so metformin be very careful guys, especially in the scenario where your creatinine clearance or EGFR is less than 30, you have to reduce the doses and less than 15, you do not prescribe metformin, be very sure of that, but you can use metformin in the range from 15 to 30, okay, and beyond 30, you do not need to reduce the dosage as well, okay. Sorry about the misprint over here, guys. Moving on to the next and one of the important questions of the evening. So the following antiarrhythmic medications is most strongly associated with pulmonary fibrosis. Now this, why I am saying is important is because this question has been repeated a lot in the exam. So you definitely need to know this one, guys. You're absolutely right. The correct answer is amiodarone. Okay. So let's find out what are the side effects of amiodaron and it has a large number of side effects. The first and the foremost side effect is the grayish or the slate gray classic skin color discoloration that is associated with amiodaron as well as photosensitivity. Drug induced hepatitis is there, ataxia, thyroid dysfunction. So amiodaron has two types of thyroid dysfunction. One is type 1 and the second one is type 2. Alright guys, if the hypothyroidism, both hyper as well as hypothyroidism can be seen, that is because amiodarone contains IOD, that is iodine, okay, the name itself has iodine in that. So that is why it causes two types of diseases, Both in both cases you can have hypothyroidism, but in the first one, the treatment is with levothyroxine, okay, but in the second one, the treatment is with steroids. Okay, because this is an it actually causes an autoimmune reaction over here in the type 2. Okay, so these are the things that are associated with amiodaron, and side effects of amiodaron are very important because the drug is administered over a very long period of time, right? Funny thing here is that it can itself cause tosar depot, which is one of the indications for amiodaron in later stages but it can also cause arrhythmias by itself. Okay. Pulmonary fibrosis can be seen in later stages of amiodarone administration and peripheral neuropathy as well. 
So slate tan is the mnemonic associated with amandron. Now you know that it contains iodine and that is why the side effects of hypothyroidism can be seen. But it can cause both hyper as well as hypothyroidism. So be aware of that. Reversible microcorneal deposits are also seen and that is why you need to perform an ocular check in the patient with ophthal checkup every year who are on amandron. Okay, But they are reversible. Now, drug causes of pulmonary fibrosis are important. Like I was telling you, bucilfan and bleomycin, they go hand in hand for causing pulmonary fibrosis. But other important drugs are methotrexate, cold, amandron here, and nitrofibrantoin. Because these drugs are administered for a long time, okay, the duration of administration usually is long. In cases of uh, sulfonamides, the administration is not very long, usually. But the drugs that are given for a longer period of time have a higher propensity to cause pulmonary fibrosis okay that is why we need to be very well aware of the side effects especially of the drugs that are administered for a longer period of time moving on to the next question of the evening that is 29 and i'll give you 15 seconds for that one Okay, so if you notice in the question, the heart rate of the patient is 40 beats per minute only and the BP is quite low. So this seems to be like a beta blocker poisoning. Okay, and the answer to that is glucagon, right? Now the patient already had a history of depression, right? And that is why this is a beta blocker poisoning case which you have to diagnose and the answer to that antagonizing of beta blockade is by glucagon also atropine can be used in that case, some cases as well depending on the scenario okay. so that is about this question in this particular case uh, history of acute angle glaucoma is a side effect of like it's a contraindication for use of atropine because this will exacerbate this that is why we are not using atropine here okay right but both of them can be used but usually the answer will not contain confusing options so you can go with glucagon as the first line okay now what is the mechanism of action of aspirin come on guys you need to do this one like very quickly and i know you will do it very quickly Absolutely correct. This is E, inhibition of arachidonic acid metabolism. Now, aspirin is very important. So, aspirin will definitely be asked in the exam in one way or the other. Okay. So, basically, irreversible inhibition of cyclooxygenase pathway directly leading to arachidonic acid pathway which forms thromboxane E2. So, this is what is inhibited. Okay. Aspirin inhibits this pathway. The other drugs, which are antiplatelets like lopidogrel, diclopidine, and prasugrel, they inhibit ADP receptor. Okay, that is an important component of platelet aggregation. So ADP receptors are blocked by lopidogrel, diclopidine, and prasugrel. These are two very important mechanisms. You need to remember drugs that is abziximab. The mechanism of action is GP2B3A inhibitor. Okay, this is again similar in action to this. These are platelet aggregation inhibitors, but you need to know the exact mechanism of action. We have already spoken about dabigatran, that is a direct thrombin inhibitor, right? And we also know now we know that heparin as well as low molecular weight heparin, like in oxaparin, they are basically causing antithrombin 3, right? Activity, right. So, this is how your antiplatelets and other drugs mechanism of action is given very beautifully in this table, but you definitely need to remember all of this. So, please download the PDF from our website. It is free for all of you. You don't need to be a member yet to download this one. 
we are conducting this whole class here on itself question number 31 for the evening which of the following would be contraindicated along with the use of sildenafil come on guys i think you know this one it is fairly simple the isosorbide mononitrate you do not need to administer two drugs which have pretty much this similar mechanism of action or both are vasodilators so sildenafil is already your pde5 inhibitor okay phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor now apart from that if you give another drug which is also a vasodilator like isosorbide mononitrate you will be risking a very severe case of vasodilation okay so other drug which is contraindicated concomitantly with sildenafil is your nicorandel which is a potassium channel opener okay now please remember guys the class 3 antiarrhythmic drugs of organ William classification they are potassium channel blockers okay but nicorandel is a drug which is potassium channel opener okay so these are the nitty-gritty facts that you need to remember in your exam okay Moving on to the last question of the evening, and I'll give you 10 seconds for this one. Okay, so the correct answer to this one is A, allopurinol, okay. Right, so this patient has new onset. You can see here, it's, everything is low, right? Platelets are also fairly low, less than 50. So this is a new onset pancytopenia, okay, drug-induced bone marrow suppression. So allopurinol, what it will do is, it will inhibit the action of azathioprine, okay? So the same enzyme, if you look here, look at this. Azathioprine is the prodrug I told you. Uh, it will get moved on to 6-mercaptopurin, 6-NP. Now this has various enzymes that change it. The first and the foremost is xanthinophilase, which is your the site of inhibition is for allopurinol and that is why allopurinol has this very dangerous side effect associated with azathioprine okay so it can cause toxicity of azathioprine basically because xanthine an oxidase will be inhibited by allopurinol here and this will in turn limit the enzymatic conversion of 6mp into its other elements like the other pathways these are your other pathways as well this is the one that is inhibited by allopurinol. So please remember this guys. Now there are some other drugs that I want to tell you about. So there is a fairly important question which is about oculogyric crisis. And you need to know this one. So this is a dystonia type reaction to certain drugs. Okay, the patient has involuntary upward. This is involuntary. Remember this guys right upward deviation of eyes so which drug causes this the fairly simple causes are metoclopramide right the other one being haloperidol Okay, and phenothiazines as well. How will you treat this condition? Because this is a an acute emergency situation, you will treat it with procyclidem. So this there is your upward rolling of eyeball. Okay. And this is involuntary. Right? So this is your oculogyric crisis, guys. And also, we were talking about 
carbon monoxide poisoning so 100% oxygen is your treatment of choice for carbon monoxide poisoning now guys i want to tell you that please do visit our website download the pdf freely from there and do post in your comments to tell us what other topics you would like us to cover what are the problems that you are facing in preparation journey okay and how we can help you more right thank you so much for being with us guys and have a lovely day thank you for being with track medicine limited and please visit our website to download the pdf of the class lecture thank you and good evening